So we're at, um, welcome to the episode two of the Anarchy Roundtable. I'm Joe. I'm Katie. I'm Daniel. I'm Ryan. And... And I'm Katie. <laughs> <laughs> no, and um, Katie, you're, you're uh, a new um, participant in the round table. So is Ryan. Don't leave um, him out. I'm going... <laughs> Privilege! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, tell us a little bit about your anarchy cred. My anarchy cred? Your anarchy Obviously cred. Not ours. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. How that? about well, just anything that you've done to participate in anarchy, or how you or came, to how it. you came to anarchy. Okay. How about the fact that you found me? I did, oh, wow. I did. I I <laughs> discovered Joe on the internet. She discovered me too um, as you were trying to help organize anarchy. Yeah, theater. in yeah. in 2011, I moved to Detroit and um, yeah, started a group called the Michigan Peace and Liberty Coalition with another woman. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> with with Yeah. With Danny. <laughs> yeah, um, and not uh, this Danny, girl Danny. And I found I also found Danny on the internet. He had started a meetup group. Yeah. And I told him it was redundant cuz I already had the best group <laughs> that there was. <laughs> we still have the meetup group by the way. And, oh, we started oh, um, a new one? Yeah, that was a different oh, one. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Let me find new people that way. Mm-hmm. Um, which is that how we found you, Ryan? We got Ryan over here. What? Tell us a little mm-hmm. bit about how you found us. No, you guys just kind of left the door open. and I just stumbled in. <laughs> I think somebody tipped me off on some group nearby or something. Okay. So I decided to check it out. So our reputation preceded us. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> the collective reputation. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be part of this. <laughs> So, um, at the end of the last roundtable, we started to get into a topic um, about how do we get to a stateless society, and um, different people had different ideas. Some people were into incrementalism. We had lots of different tactics, which weren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, And what, what are your thoughts on that? Gradualism versus... Revolutionary or or speedy, either way, how, however you want to term that. I I don't like James's idea of violent um, methodology. I, as I said before, I think uh, civil disobedience and education, in particular, um, and I guess to some extent psychological reasoning, would definitely aid people in getting out of the mindset that. We are evil, and we need this thing to whip us into line. That's my point of view. So, when you talk about civil disobedience, are you talking about the traditional um, definition of civil disobedience, where you um, go out in public and make a display of your disobedience in order to get arrested? Is that, is that what you're thinking, or I guess you I have something else? I guess I really haven't fleshed it out too much in my head because I was just kind of speaking in general uh, themes. But I guess to an extent, yeah, as long as it's not... um, Yeah, what? All of the above? No. uh, I don't... If you want to get arrested, go ahead. But um, (laughs) But that's not your goal. It's not my goal. um, But I would look into, if you're going to do it, look for avenues or ways, or at least... um, uh, arrest or the charges that are very minimal um not something where you're you know don't go murder someone or something like that. don't <laughs> well, that, don't, that don't would, rob the government two million dollars i was gonna dollars. say that wouldn't fall in our principles and you right to kill don't, someone but um you're saying don't go um <clears throat> don't go sabotage a, a um piece of military equipment or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I wouldn't... You wouldn't advocate that. If you're being arrested for tax evasion, I'd say that's probably... I don't really like that because they come down hard on tax evaders or tax, um, like, uh, Irwin Schiff. But I actually yeah, like his strategy. he was in jail for a long time for that. I do like his strategy because it, it shows this is the truth. There is nothing really behind uh, taxation in terms of legality. You mean ethics or 
No, there's actually, as far as I can tell, there's no actual strong law that says they can um, uh, take away our, our income or part of our income. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that was kind of an invention at the turn of the century. Yeah, but it was repealed, and then it was just kind of like, it's been left on since World War uh, One or World War II. It's probably the first one. Whatever. Point is, he rebelled against it, and... I like. I admire that. Income tax was 1913. Yeah. Yeah. But they've had income tax before for right. wars. Right. And then after, yeah, it was it World War One? They just kept it on, even though it was uh, supposed to sunset after the war. Right. That's how so many government programs are. They they sunset. What about you, Katie? How do I think we could achieve? How how, how could we achieve? A stateless society. Well, I think there are places for um, a variety of different strategies. I don't think there's just one right. one answer. But for me, um, I think a combination of civil disobedience, a nonviolent civil disobedience, okay. and um, uh, education, just sharing ideas with different people, empathy, empathizing with people who want to use the government um, as a strategy to achieve their goals and and try to understand what it is that they're trying to achieve and then provide alternatives to that. Um, and then also peaceful parenting, I think, is oh, yeah. really a huge... Um, uh, yeah, it has huge potential for a long-term uh, approach. So what is it about peaceful parenting that will help um, bring about a stateless society? Or maybe maybe we look at it the other way around. What is it about non stand or stand? We'll call it. Um, what should we call the other parenting? Um, culturally normative parenting. Culturally normative <laughs> oh, <God>. parenting. <laughs> that sounds super liberal. <laughs> <laughs> Just I don't know traditional parenting. Yeah. Or conventional. Name. Conventional. I like conventional. Um, what is it about conventional parenting, you think, <laughs> that brings about, uh, facilitates the violence that is the state? Well, with conventional parenting, uh, most of us were probably raised in families that used uh, power over as opposed to power with kind of strategies. Oh. And by that, I mean um, punishment and rewards, conditional parenting, saying if you do this, then threatening them with a the punishment. Um, and... That's that's just a microcosm of the macrocosm of government, where we have laws and authority and power over and um, yeah. So I think that if children aren't raised believing that other people have some sort of authority over them just because of um, who they are, then it's a lot less likely that the government will will be successful in ruling over them. Yeah. yeah. For sure, because they're not taught. They're not taught that um, that mentality of of uh, submissiveness, obedience, and obedience mm-hmm. in the home. So then, when when they go outside the home in that situation, then they're and they're exposed to. Um, I don't want to use the. It's so hard when you have the status words. I'm about to say the word authority, but. Um, that's that's not really the appropriate word. Coercion. For, um, yeah, when they're exposed to the coercion of the state, um, it's going to be foreign to them. It'll recoil from it. Mm-hmm. Versus, um, um, if if you're just used to being treated that way your whole life, you might not even really notice it if a cop um, comes up to you and de- you know is demanding of your behavior in a certain way, or or even something written down. You're just used to doing whatever you're told. Well, I think that's part of it. I think Katie's right in at least a parental sphere. But another aspect that I tend to rage against is um, the religious aspect. That is real, I think, is a real source. You mean like Pledge of Allegiance and National Anthem and everybody's like hand over their heart and praying to the altar of the... Federal government. And that's all that. that's a learned behavior, but it's coming from. Um, um, I think part of it that at least uh, reinforces that notion is 
a lot of people believe in some super entity that has basically condemned humanity and said, if you don't love me, you will die in a fiery hell. And that's really hard to get out of people. I've seen more success with people um, giving up on government than I have seen people give up on, I'll just say, generally, God. And that whole God notion, the whole religious notion, feeds into the authoritarian um, mindset. And it's really hard. Even the Christian anarchists, the Muslim anarchists, they still have that obedience mindset. There are a lot of prominent Christian anarchists that have put out some pretty good um, but it's content all... about ant being anti-state. I wonder... Um, you know, you don't get to hear, you don't get to see them at home to, to see what, what you're describing. So I wonder what um, degree of obedience is in their homes. Well, if you're, um, if you're being told as a kid, hey, we're going to church, you got to kneel and pray at whenever the pastor says so and recite little chants, it, it's, it is authoritarian because you're still, thinking that there's this entity that's above you that can reach down and subtract you from earth whenever it feels like. Yeah. But then you think about, um, have you ever seen the state is too dangerous to tolerate? Uh, by Robert Higgs. I it's think a, I may. It's have. a great talk. I believe it's at the Mises Institute. Um, it doesn't really matter where it is, but, um, I've never heard a more powerful indictment of the state than what Robert Higgs can um, produce in a talk. Um, he does an excellent job with that. And then he lays down the logic for anarchy after his indictment. <clears throat> but that doesn't get into, you know, the topics that you're bringing up. So it's just kind of interesting that there are, it seems to be Catholic anarchists. You know, you've got Robert Higgs, Jeffrey Tucker, uh -huh. um, Tom Woods. Yeah. Um, isn't Lou Rockwell also? Um, he's another Christian or believer. Isn't he Catholic? I'm not sure. He's, he's religious. He's definitely religious. Um, I do want to say there are so many different ways to experience religion. No. I, yeah. They, no. I mean, just look at how many different ways they interpret the Bible. We don't really know if someone's saying that they're Catholic, how they understand what. They don't. What, <laughs> what role that God plays? I mean, we don't know, right? So I, I think some of the problems of religion aren't necessarily that. Yes, okay. So there's there's some in at least in Christianity, like deference to this ob obedient, oh, to this authoritative God, but. And also, wives are to be obedient to their husbands. Um, one of for the, the for the 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 people who are really following Christianity follow that. I've listened to like focus on the family, and they they stress that in uh, eye for an eye, spare the rod. Yeah, well, they 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 stress that the man is the um, is in charge of the household, and the wife is to be obedient to the man. Um, I've heard him talk about this many times on the on the radio. One idea that I think is particularly problematic is that um, the idea that human beings are inherently flawed. Or bad or evil and they yeah, can't be trusted and that is what justifies having other people control them because we can't trust each other there's there's that's a good point yeah so that would be the idea that I'd be more concerned about and that's mixed in both the state and um, the church yeah yeah both we yeah. can't trust people so they need to be ruled yeah and you're inherently flawed so I have to I have to rule you, you so yeah that's what I was getting at, is that psychology. You need to break that somehow. And I would say it's next... I don't, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's damn near close. It's really hard to get to get people to admit that there's some. they have their own cognitive dissonance in regards to either religion or the state, or both. Reminds me of bicameralism. Jamesian bicameral, bicameralism. Where he basically says that Ancient people were incapable of identifying that the voice inside their head was them thinking. Oh. So they thought it was 
They interpret it as a god telling them what to do. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. According to the theory. This brings anyway. up something else. I think everybody mentioned education is a key to shifting towards a, a, a different culture. And here, we're, we'll go ahead and do yes, whatever you need to do. But, but I hear, what I'm hearing people say is that, okay, so when they're presented with these ideas... They aren't open to considering something different than what they already understand. And so I want to understand how do people get to the point where they're open to considering a new idea? How do they learn a, a new idea? How do we open people's minds? And why is it that their minds are closed? There could be a whole something? science behind that. I, yeah, kind of into that. <laughs> yeah, I never even, you know, that that is something. Yeah. So what, like, how would you study something like that? Like, do you have any idea, like, what kind of experiments you would do? Like, be some kind of social experiment, wouldn't it? Like, um, I don't know how, how would you study that? What, um... Well, I mean, we have all kinds of empirical studies of our own, like, just by having conversations with sure. people, right? Sure, yeah. We've, we've practiced a lot, you know, what mm -hmm. works, what Maybe doesn't. Maybe anecdotal. Um, oh, the, yes, thank you, anecdotal. <laughs> yeah. That's, what did Maybe... I say, empirical? Oh, yeah. Well... There, there is something. So the first step to science is going to be observation. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go out into the world. You're going to try a bunch of things. You're going to observe some things, and from that, you're going to develop an idea, a hypothesis. They, they, the, the science people like to call it. Um, <laughs> so I can, I would be willing to share like my. And, and then, well, let me just finish, okay, and then we'll yeah, get to yeah, that. Sure. And then you could, you know, you come up with an idea that you want to test, and then. You could create an experiment to test that idea based on your your observations, and so that's probably where your thoughts are going right now. Mm -hmm. And what's what kind of experiment were you thinking? I mean, I know when I first became uh, clear on the non-aggression principle, and and, so, um, and what is the non-aggression principle? Uh, it's this whole idea that I'm not going to initiate force against anybody else, and I'm only going to interact with people in a voluntary way and okay. if for some reason they initiate force against my person or my property then i can defend myself but i don't want to do it in a way for me that's punitive or that's going to cause any more harm than necessary to stop the damage to myself and my property that's my interpretation of it so once i became clear on this idea like that made sense to yeah. me um, I got really excited because all of a sudden, like, I had a principle that I could go and test everything against and have a lot of clarity and, 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 um, new understanding. So I wanted to share this with people in my life, like my mom and my brothers and sisters and anybody that was willing to talk to me. <laughs> and, um, I came to it from a moralistic standpoint, like it is wrong to initiate force and it's right not to initiate force and i'm right and you're wrong okay and so let's have a conversation about how stupid you are nice and it wasn't i didn't say it that explicitly right but that was the other person's experience of this sure. conversation Ooh. because i was <laughs> i was coming to it as if i had the truth and that they needed to change their mind to agree with me in that immediate conversation. And my goal was to change their mind. Now, that almost never worked. Every once in a while, someone who was ready would be like, oh, oh, you know, and then they, <laughs> and then they would get it. But I mean, that was like very few and far be between. That didn't, most of the time that didn't happen. I got some sort of emotional reaction or like, oh, that'll never work. And you know, we can't trust people and this and that, like that was the most common experience that I got. And then, and then there wasn't really a curiosity to try to figure out like, why did I see things differently? And so I wanted to understand like, what is it about that? Like, how can I inspire other people to get curious about this idea? Because I think it's really valuable for humanity. We could change yeah. the world and, and have a more peaceful culture. So, then I learned about um, some other <laughs> some other us. We have a four-legged anarchist participating in the talk today. <laughs> oh, it's Mike's trying to call us. He was trying to call me too. No, maybe we should take a break and okay. uh, and take his call. Um, you can just leave it. Um, leave it, leave it running. Go ahead. Yeah. Come over Hello. And turn it off. No, it's fine. someone's here. Hey, doing 
Okay, yeah, you're in our video now. We've got Mike, who's joined the uh, Anarchy Roundtable from it's our afar. first caller. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, it's about 10 o'clock, if you guys want to do something then, too. Okay. Oh, wow. Just for a couple hours. All right. Like strippers? Are we All doing right. strippers? Damn it. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> So yeah. are we good? We took it yeah. Time? Okay, so I wanted to understand, like, why why weren't people curious? And I and I studied this, like, how can I connect with people? And um, then I started to understand, like, childhood trauma and how that uh, impacts people. And that's one piece of the puzzle that I think is key to this whole thing. Um, and then I figured out this whole stuff about empathy and like Ew. how that can, <laughs> that can really, really um, help. People want to be heard. So often we have these yeah. conversations, especially in political debates. I want to be heard. You want to be heard. Right. So we're just talking at each other and nobody's hearing what the other person is saying. Really. We're just going one point to the next point, to the next point, to the next point. But what would happen if I actually, heard what you said first before going on to my point. Yeah. And that's one different approach that I've tried to take is that when someone's saying like, wow, I really would love to have universal health care or Ooh. I would really love to implement this new law to get this goal that I want, you know, like, and for me, I'm like, whoa, okay, that doesn't work for me, but I want to find out what's important to the other person here. Not just look at the strategy that they're taking. Like, what what is the underlying motivation for that strategy? And then connect with them at the motivation level and help them to see that I hear what they're saying and until they feel heard. And then they have space to hear what's going on for me. But not until that point. Right. So... Um, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and also taking conversations as, like not trying to change people's mind, but just being curious and wanting to connect with them and, and get a shared understanding and trust that over a period of who knows how long, those kinds of conversations can stack up to lead to more curiosity and openness instead of trying to push it on them. And if, if you think about like how children learn and, and our whole, I'm imagining we all kind of have a shared reality about the standard educational approach of like forcing people to learn things when they're not necessarily wanting to do that, that creates resistance. It's the same with any other adult human being. If I'm going to say like, here, you need to learn this now. <laughs> I don't want to learn that. Like, you know, there, you like, know I'm not some, ready for that. I can't remember the name of the author, but somebody um, wrote a book called Start With Why. Mm -hmm. And he, he, what his, he was saying is that anytime you want to motivate somebody to do something or think something or um, feel something, anytime you want to have an influence on someone because... For, for whatever reason, you, you think it would be beneficial that their thoughts go in this direction, mm -hmm. you start with why first. Because if you just tell somebody, um, let me, I'm trying to think of a good, a good example. Um, how about um, if, if uh, I'm trying to. Struggling to come up with an example, but if you just um, taxation to, stuff, well, that's that's um, that, that's not really what I'm getting at. We should implement um, this new law. We should implement this new law. So, if you want somebody to implement, that's a horrible idea, by the way. But let's go with it. People who um, eat meat are bad. We should make eating meat illegal. So, all right, we should make eating meat illegal. So, if you walk up to somebody, pansies. Yeah, this, this is also a very bad idea, but let's go with it. Um, <laughs> somebody could propose so, that. Yeah. Somebody, so you could walk up to Ryan and say, we should make meat illegal. Make meat illegal now. You have a big old sign and you're mm -hmm. going around with it. Save and the cows. Save, yeah, save the cows. Now you're getting closer to a why there. So um, <laughs> instead of saying, make meat illegal now, you say... Cows are experiencing this, you know, horrible pain. death and pain in slaughterhouses. Um, therefore, if, you know, you, you could lay it out more complex than this, but you're starting with this is what's happening. This is why I'm emotional about this. 
here's a solution to this problem and or you maybe the other person could even come up with it what you know you might say this is happening you might start with why and the other person might even give you the what but if you just start with the what then they might be resistant like i don't want to quit eating meat well because so often when we yeah. when we propose a what they shut down it's this what, what or nothing else right there might be other what's there could be 10,000 other what's. Yeah. Wet. Or maybe that what <laughs> is the best what, but when you say that what, you haven't captured their attention. So like if you write why a, do I want that what? Yeah. So you write a 200-page book, say, on doing something. If you start the book out with the process of doing this, you could lose the audience in the first chapter because you're telling them to do this, but they don't even know why they're going to do it. Maybe you put the why on the cover. Okay, so so why would we want to have a free society? Uh, way to put it on us. That's excellent. <laughs> um, so, um, I hit you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> so why do we want a free society? Yeah, what good is that? Um, how about you, Ryan? What do you think? Uh, and this is from... From your heart. Why do you want a free society? Why do I want a free society? Yeah. He wants the gays to get married. <laughs> you want the gays to get married. All right. If they want to. <laughs> if they want to. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very Is progressive of you, Ryan. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Why most people probably want a free society is, well, they want to be left to their own devices for the most part. So people want to be able to do what they want to do without... Without harassment. Without harassment. What about you, Danny? What, why do you want a free society? I'm tired of supporting people who won't pull their own weight. I'm tired of paying 40% of my income to supposedly roads and bombs. That's... I want to be left the fuck alone. All right. Leave Danny alone! <laughs> I am too, apparently. <laughs> we should get a picture of you and meme that right into this. Look. <laughs> no, I agree with you, though. I'm just making fun of you. I know. But, um, I no. was going to say, BDSM is my thing, so I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, what? <laughs> What is most attractive to you about a free society since we, we've got two of the big ones that are already named? Um, what's another take on it? What, what about a free society is appealing to you? I really, really, really value peace. And I see wars between governments killing millions of people. People who wouldn't have any other reason to kill each other if it weren't for, you know, the government telling them that that's, they have yeah. a reason. Um, so that's one reason. Definitely. Is I, I really value peace. And not just, you know, military versus military, but also um, other state agents versus cattle. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what you want to the call The human them. cattle, yes. <laughs> Ranchers are. versus cattle. Ranchers versus cattle. I think the Australian government was uh, at a war with emus. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. So, yeah, I definitely agree with all of those. Um, Ryan wants to be left to do as he will as long as he's, I'm assuming, as long as you're not hurting other people, I'm, I'm guessing, right? You, you oh, don't it's a safe it. assumption that if I want to do what I want to do, or if I want to continue doing whatever it is I'm doing, then in doing that, I can't, I can't make it so other people can't do what they want to do. That wouldn't be freedom because then they'd be free to do that to you. It would be like a well, big circle, yeah, not freedom. The door for reciprocation. Yeah. Uh, and Danny wants to keep all of the money that he earns and choose who to give it to if he wants to give it away. Yeah. You're I looking just... for a peaceful society without all of the death and destruction and murder. And also just, you know, freedom to exchange ideas. We're talking about intellectual oh, property, yeah. um, like to, to make technological advances with um, 
space travel and medicine and all kinds of different things that laws inhibit and we'll restrict. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> well, you know, and that, and that actually comes into... Um, There's um, a... that's, that's fine. We can just keep going. Um, that comes... Yeah, that's fine. Oh, the battery died? That's what it said. Okay. Um, do you have another battery? I do. <laughs> um, well, let's Way just finish up this up. segment. And then we'll do the battery after. Cause <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll just go with this we'll, one. We'll be on that camera. Um, that that comes into what, what I was thinking that um, hasn't been brought up yet. Is that um, if you look, even within the statist world that we live in now... <laughs> The smaller states, as a percentage of the GDP of um, that state, shows a significant amount of uh, growth in GDP that's above, that, that's highly correlated to the size of the state, inversely. So, if you have 1% of GDP growth above another state for like 70 years, the size of your economy is going to be, I don't remember the numbers, but it's like two or three times larger um, just by having your state be smaller. If you got rid of it, if you got rid of the IP that you're talking about, that's that's stymieing the growth of our um, economy. Software, software, and software tech. and uh, tech. engineering, even music. The music choices that I went to just for the introduction of these talks was limited to three songs that a friend, um, Wes Alexander, um, put together for me to put on videos because I didn't want to have YouTube take down the um, the copyright. It, was, it turned out to be a, a good song that um, Wes wrote and that we put on the other video, but it would have been nice to have, you know, a billion choices of songs to put on here, but I chose from three songs. Um, now, you could have practiced some civil disobedience, but then there's a risk there because, because then you can't share your ideas with right. as many people if it gets taken down. Yeah, and I put, a, I put a blog post about IP. It, it hasn't been posted yet, but I wrote it the other day. Um, Mike is working on editing it, um, where I talked about how technology i talked about a lot of things but one thing in there was about how tech there's this fight in the technology between the people who want to usurp the ip technology and the people who are coming up with more technology to um, hide it or to, to keep it owned and youtube is pretty successful with their technology to um, keep IP down, and I've had to an extent. I've had videos get taken down because somebody claimed ownership of the song that I had in my video, and then I have other videos that other people are running ads on my video to get money off of my videos um, because their song is in it, and it's like twenty seconds of song, and they get to run an ad on my video, and my video might be half an hour long. Have you looked into? Um... My dad likes old crappy music, um, but there's actually a register, a registry that you can go to and download songs that the copyright has expired. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I should check that out. Yeah, because we could get we could get some more music. But I kind of like the intro, the intro that we have. Let's take a little break and. Um, I wanted to hear why you want a free society. Oh. He doesn't want um, one. <laughs> so, well, no, I mean that's that's what I would what I would, what I was getting at is we would be the conclusion of what I was saying about the one percent growth rate and the economy being so mm -hmm. much bigger is that we would be extraordinarily wealthier, and this wealth would come would would bear dividends in a in a couple of different ways depending on our choices. Um, huh. One one okay. way. Joe, is, is the information that you're getting, or the source of that information, that uh, that U of M study that came out, or that an economist did? Um, you know, I read econom economics blogs for 10 years. I don't no, always remember. Don't remember which one. <laughs> I don't always remember where my economics information comes from, but I, I believe that this is, um, it's the, w as far as the GDP growth correlating, or inversely correlating to... Um, we got to be careful with GDP. 
I, I understand yeah. that. It's not a perfect yeah. measurement. Um, I don't want to get okay. too too deep into that um, because the the rate of the, the 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 difference is so dramatic between the countries over extended over multiple decades that it's pretty clear that the size of a state's um, presence in the economy of that state has a significant impact on the it's GDP growth rate, which over a period of decades affects the overall size of their GDP, which could be measured in other ways besides GDP itself, but in terms of like their economic output um, per person or um, capital. There, there's, there's a number of different metrics for measuring um, um, standard of living, quality of life. Um, so anyway, back to what my, my conclusion, having this greater wealth available to all of the individuals within society means, um, first of all, you have greater material affluence, you have greater freedom over your economic situation, you have a greater ability to save, you have a greater ability to take time for yourself if you don't want to have all of your wealth spent on material abundance or services and products, um, maybe you want to travel travel, or take take some more time off. If you weren't giving, giving 40% of your money um, or 50% as some countries or even almost close to 60% to a government, which granted sometimes it's buying things that you would buy with that money, but it's doing it in a way that is far less efficient than the way you would spend your own money. If you weren't doing that, you would have so much more savings, say um, savings and wealth at your expo for um, at your disposal to do with whatever it is that you want to do with it, rather than what a third party wants to do with it and to support a third party. So that's actually why I believe the yellow is in the flag there that is that represents the prosperity that comes from statelessness i just hate roads <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we hate roads and old people and, and children. old people and children and poor minorities people. And yeah all of these people just hate them all <laughs> Are we toasting or what the fuck are we doing? We're gonna toast! Okay. What are... Salute! To freedom! The liberty and freedom. Poor people. We... We... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two beers, two beers and two To trolls! <laughs> to trolls. And, and people who don't also shout to freedom. Yes. As you might have noticed, there is an, an anarchy yeah, symbol the, on the table. Yeah, don't tell these guys what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there we go. There's the excitement. And, and, and who has the topic? Is there a topic? <laughs> no. Oh, there's no topic. Okay. okay. No, I got no idea. Ryan's got a topic. Okay. okay. We have a topic we're going to discuss. So, I'll often see people say that we need government because if it weren't for government, we wouldn't have scientific advancement because they put all this funding into random research yeah projects. just just think about it we couldn't have the internet to talk about anarchy if it wasn't for um was it darpa well i thought it was al gore <laughs> darpa with al gore coming in with the assist <laughs> that's not necessarily true if you actually look at the internet infrastructure the very primitive internet infrastructure yeah that was private and the internet itself did not develop the same way in one place. Um, if I remember correctly, in, for example, Romania, an internet basically came up, came into being organic. So there was a by, second internet in Romania. But, That's like the airplane. You know, we we practically worship at the altor by we. That, that's horrible. Who are you talking about? They're not us. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't <laughs> group me in with, with those animals. I got you. People. No. Some people. Eh. Yeah. <laughs> there are people out there. <laughs> there are animals out there. The, Let's there, start with an observation. There are people out there. This is the observation. Okay, all right. There are people out there, a pretty large uh, proportion of them, who... Oh, we got, we got some. 
We got static. We, we've got some static going on the video with, with some, <laughs> some chemistry <laughs> eating popcorn in the background. <laughs> Excellent. Um, <laughs> he's hungry. We, we're going to have dinner shortly. Um, People really like airplanes. Oh, airplanes. <laughs> Back to what we were saying. So there's a lot of people out there um, who war- practically worship at the altar of the Wright brothers. Like, Wright brothers invented airplanes. Go America! We're the first ones. No, we wouldn't have airplanes if Actually, not for Brazil the Wright brothers. The first ones. Um, so he, he heard about Brazil um, in France. There was also a contender for the first airplane um, potentially. And then it starts to come into how do you define an airplane and oh, there's like all kinds of things. If the Wright brothers had never existed, we probably would have had flight in the same year or another year. Um, very close. Same yeah, era. Same, very, very close to the same time is, is um, that basically what was happening with the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. And um, based on the articles that I've read, uh, that one's probably been three. <laughs> She's distracting I'm, us. I'm hot. <laughs> oh, well. We, we already yeah. know that you're hot, Katie. <laughs> you're at least in the top three. Yeah. Yeah. In this table? No. In this table? All right. Anyway, um, it wasn't until recent decades, probably 20, 30 years, if I remember right, that um, the amount of discoveries has shifted from um, mostly government funneling into private sector, whereas it used to be private sector funneling into government projects. And in a lot of sectors, particular, particularly like pharmaceuticals, it's still that way. So the private sector comes up with a idea or... Um, process or whatever, and then yeah. the, Although, and the granted, government researchers come in and... All Take granted, credit for it. There's a lot of um, what's the word? Subsidies. Yeah. And an in, ever increasing amount of subsidies. Yeah, like wasn't concrete invented by private um, people who were trying to? Concrete was invented a very, very long time ago. Or not concrete. Um, the process that they use for making paved roads that way wasn't that asphalt. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, <laughs> never mind. Oh, you're like staring at me as if I have some no, type of answer. You're about to say something. That's why. No, I was but, thinking um, about the assembly line, and that was. Uh, oh yeah. There wasn't necessarily an invention, from what I understand. It was Henry Ford borrowing a concept from um, the canning industry. Oh yeah. Yeah, he. They had the disassembly line, and he, if I recall correctly, he reversed and said, "This is how I could apply it to cars." Yeah. So. So we tend to think of Ford, Ford as being the guy who invented this, but he was influenced heavily on um, similar processes in other industries, and this is something that's very common in um, the process of invention or innovation. Um, innovations have a time that they come into. Um, you couldn't have had an airplane until you had an engine to put on it. Um, the same thing with the internet. You couldn't have the internet until you had computers to put on it and a number of other technologies related to that. So a lot of times the technology just kind of is inevitable. If one person doesn't invent it, another will, because everything that's needed to invent that technology is in place. Oh, that's what the show Connections is about. Oh. Do you think it's kind of the same with anarchism? What do you mean? I mean just the same as as the internet or some other sort of technology. Different ideas oh. in culture seem to appear around similar times and, and like, movements happen. And maybe at this point you're just, like, at the beginning of the... The inception of the idea. Yeah. And it's not yet dispersed and become normal. Like if you if you look at maybe um, the culture around cannabis. Yeah. 
you know, that's slowly becoming like less of an issue. Well, I think culturally. I, I think of the evolutionary process that started um, before even the Magna Carta. Um, there were some uh, less known histories, less known, so I don't even remember. But um, <laughs> no, I've heard about this. But like, people like to point to the Magna Carta as this big turning point, but even that wasn't. There were things that led up to the Magna Carta. Mm -hmm. But um, look, we could even just start with the Magna Carta, where that was the first time that the king was really significantly brought under um, pressure by the pr noblemen. pressure by the nobles and and the other people who are higher up in society that maybe the the king isn't all powerful and then from there we, we've we've just had these incremental um updates to the technology of statism really or, or the technology of organizing society how about mm. we say that because yeah. um and there have been some reversals and there was some experiments that have taken it the other way if you think of like um, the soviet union and their their communism but um, there has been this this progression of ideas um, where they're trying out different things, and as we find things that aren't working, then there's this desire to try something new. And you know, in 1787, people thought it was a good idea to come up with this. You know, we'll we'll write down on some sacred parchment. Um, the rules for government so that it can never be broken and people thought, you know, that would constrain it and they came up with all these processes with the, um, you know, the, the separation of powers and all this stuff and clearly that hasn't worked. So, you know, trial and error, maybe we're at a point now where the next thing people try is um, flushing the entire system down the toilet altogether and letting people be free. Quick question, Joe. Is that supposed to be off? It's it's just the screen. Okay. Um, good good observation though. Uh, just wanted to make sure. Gold yeah. star. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Is it a scratch and sniff? <laughs> Those are my favorite ones. Yeah. No, I, I can see your reasoning, but I, I I actually had an argument with the liberal about that. Oh no. And um, his argument that sounds horrible. was that. Humans have not evolved enough yet to be, um, to cope with the idea of total freedom. So, humanity is about 200,000 years old. Yeah, but civilization is about, what, 10? Civilization is about 10,000. The state is about 6,000. Uh, Ish. We don't know the exact date. It's kind of, where do you go from... So, the point is... For 194,000 years of human history, there has been no state. Now, granted, the state came about as a parasite on the wealth creation abilities that came about after farming made sedentary lifestyle and wealth creation possible. By sedentary, I don't mean you sit at home all day or no work at a nomadic. desk. No longer nomadic. Yeah. Well, let me ask Stationary? you. Stationary? Do you think the state is at it's his, historical uh, precedent organic. And what I mean by that is there was someone that sat there and said, okay, there is a dispute um, between us. We should find a third party. Like, I, I get the impression that they went up to, like, the strongest guy of the tribe and said, okay, which one of us is right? And that's basically where it started. And I still see that behavior... Nowadays, I can see the embedded warlord as being another likely one. I think the state probably started from multiple places, but a big component of the start of the state is the roaming gang of thieves that settled in amongst the people. Um, I think that more than anything created kings, which led to the whole evolutionary process that we just talked about um so there's a gang of thieves they're they're walking around on the the prairie and um they come across the village full of people who are farming they've acquired some wealth in the form of a farm that's able to produce food and these guys don't want to farming's hard work these no guys should have they, done it yeah and it was harder before they invented the steel shovel even um you ever do a horse plow <laughs> 
Yeah, and that's like or- it's, I'm, fucking I'm, 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 <laughs> it's fucking horrible. It's fucking horrible. And a horse plow is orders of magnitude more efficient than what these guys had to work with. They didn't even have a steel shovel. Yeah. Um, they had to use their hands and dig along. Lines. Yeah. So farming was grueling, hard work, and these guys found it a lot easier to just come in with a spear and say, "You will give me some of your food," and. They would come into villages, and they would probably just take all the food, and then they would move on to another village, and another village, and another village. And they couldn't really acquire wealth themselves, because they were just taking the food and moving on. Eventually, they figured out, if we settle in this village, we can just take a little bit of their food at a time. And then... um, Allow them to grow more food, and then we'll take it. And then that led to other gangs wanting to come in on this. And they said, well, we'll defend you from the other gang. And then that's the first time you have the situation where um, they feel like the gang is doing something for them. Because when the other gang comes in, they take everything. But this gang only takes, you know, 10, 20% of their food. And in the totalitarianism. Yeah. So now they feel like their gang leader... Um, who's quickly becoming a king is protecting them when in reality they're pro- he's protecting them in the same way that a cattle rancher protects his um, herd of cattle so that he can have them slaughtered later or in this case he's only slaughtering them a little bit but for as long as possible <laughs> for as long as possible <laughs> he, he found a way to get the cows to grow meat that he can cut off of a little bit at a time while the cow doesn't die. It reminds but, me of uh, that, uh, that video uh, that was making fun of the, the common uh, argument against libertarianism in general is, oh, if the, if the government's non-existent or too weak, won't warlords just come in and take over? <laughs> I mean, like, that is the government. Yeah, like, they, that said? That, that happens um, all the time. Who was it that said that... Uh, Libertarian or anarchism is there's a risk that uh, warlords might take over or somebody might attack somebody else, and that government is a guarantee that it'll happen. So, the reason we can't have government is because a government might form. <laughs> That's what it boils down to. Yeah, I've, I've run into that a lot. How about you, Katie? Yeah, I've heard that. I'm just I'm thinking about like. Kind of what Danny was saying is, is are there people maybe that aren't ready or can't conceive of anarchism as, like, like if we could push the button? <laughs> that sounds like a topic <laughs> for episode three. <laughs> would you or would you not push the button? For what? To make anarchy. You mean the big red button? The big red button. The anarchy now button. Would you push it? Oh. 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 Oh.